Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Pods of War, a series of podcasts and video ruminations about war and history. And um, I, I'm your host, uh, John Buckley, and I have with me today our regular uh, uh, attendees, guests and superheroes of uh, the history of warfare, Spencer Jones and Howard Fuller. So welcome, welcome, chaps. How are you today? Good job. Thank you very much. That's nice um, to hear, though. Yes. Still with us well. there. Good, 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 good. That's well, unlike me, who's just been diagnosed with COVID, but there we go. So um, I, I'm uh, sealed in a cocoon in, in Bridgenall, so I'm quite safe from the rest of the world for once. Um, in, um, in this first uh, of these podcasts and video casts, I thought what we could do and what we've discussed is to consider um, some of the background to why we might study war and military history. Uh, what has led us to this? Um, intriguing and interesting pastime stroke career, um, two together, I guess. Um, so what would be a good way of starting is to know what was the first thing that brought us to our subject? What are kind of first recollections? We'll try and build a picture of what makes a military historian like what we are um, uh, and try and build a picture. Um, Spencer, go on, tell us all about it. Why, why are you here? <laughs> Well, I, I would put this down to the classic 1950s British film, The Battle of the River Plate. Oh, and God. probably my earliest memory of finding military history intriguing was I'd have been four or five years old. And my grandfather, and of course lived through the Second World War, was babysitting me. My parents were doing something that I, I remember it was winter, uh, so they might have been Christmas shopping. So I was at his. And it was a, it would have been a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. And he said, do you want to watch a film? So, absolutely. And he said, well, there's a film on about the war. Would you like to watch that? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And it was Battle of the River Plate. Now, bear in mind, I've got that un, uh, untarnished child's mind. I'd never seen a war film in my life up to this point. And although I had a vague idea about what war might look like, I'd never seen it so vivid and in the flesh. And I, the, the most vivid memory of being sat on the floor, not even sat on the sofa, I was so into the action, I had to be really close to the TV so I could be right, really close to absorb the, the gun recoils as Exeter was firing or being hit by, uh, by Grafsch Bay. It was absolutely thrilling. And I was completely blown away by the, the drama, the action. I'd never seen anything like it. And my parents actually came back to collect me before the film ended. And I remember I was really unhappy because I was desperate to see the end of this film. I absolutely, it just blew me away. And from, from that point, I became temporarily, at the, the age of approximately four or five, obsessed with the Battle of the River Plate. And to be quite honest, gentlemen, fast forward decades on, I still am sort of obsessed with the Battle of the River Plate. So that, that's my earliest memory of being intrigued by, by military history. So the corrupting influence of television yeah led me to be uh, become interested in military history. Film plays a big big part in it, I think, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, you say about the Battle of the River Plate, I remember being at primary school, so a bit older than that, when I was about 10, and we had to do presentations in front of the rest of the class about one of our pet favourite subjects, and I did a presentation about the Battle of the River Plate. <laughs> oh, parallel lives, if only I've been in your class, John. Yeah, obviously it was... Um, uh, influenced by the film in the same kind of way. Um, yeah, you know, fil films are, are, are quite important. Howard, what about you? Well, uh, I was thinking about this before, and uh, I jotted down some notes. All right, so here we go. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, here He's we go. prepared. He's prepared. No, I'm living here. <laughs> I'm leaving it in my pocket for a couple of days. So I've got basically three types of influences that I think had a bearing on why I ended up doing what I'm doing. Uh, one was culture. So uh, books or movies or, or, or comic books or anything like that, but particularly say films, okay, fine, but also video games. Um, uh, second would be, I'd call like home environment or your family. So that's also what Spence had touched on as well. When you've got uh, a relative, you know, a, a parent, you know, who is kind of in that area with you, you know, they put you on your knee, put you on their knee and, you know, sort of introduce you to, let me tell you a story. 
Uh, that goes back, you know, whatever, to, to people sitting around campfires and telling tales, I suppose. Let me tell you about the great hunt, this kind of thing. And the third factor is a classic one as well, an inspirational teacher. So uh, in school, I had the benefit uh, a couple of times, but particularly when I was in uh, American high school, I had a uh, very good uh, history teacher, Jerry Kaler, and uh, everybody loved him. And I think it was him as well as another teacher I, w I had in high school who was uh, Mr. James, who was doing journalism, that uh, I was torn between journalism and history. And in the end, uh, history sort of, sort of won out. But that was, I think, probably due to the uh, influences of the other factors, like I said. Uh, it didn't hurt that my father was the Air Weather Service historian. Uh, Air Weather Service was part of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, they were headquartered in uh, what was called Military Airlift Command at Scott Air Force Base. So I kind of grew up next to an Air Force base. I was sort of an Air Force brat my, myself. My dad had been in the Air Force, and when he went out and did a master's degree in history, his dissertation, by the way, was on uh, the use of balloons in the American Civil War. So <laughs> there you go. But uh, he got a job as a historian, like a civil service historian, with the Air Force. So uh, when I grew up, there were loads of history books around the house. Uh, I remember some rainy afternoons where I would just pick up a book, and there I was reading, well, Churchill, because that was a big one. But uh, one of the cross-currents that I had that came to the front when I was a teenager was uh, Will and Ariel Durant, their History of Civilization series, which I think won a Pulitzer Prize uh, in history in 1970 or something. And uh, my dad loved the Durants, and it turned out that Jerry Kaler in a high school was also teaching off of the, the Durant uh, series. Unfortunately, they only went from prehistory all the way up to uh, Napoleon, so they got up to about 1815, and then they stopped. It just got too old, but it's a with a ten volume series, absolutely brilliant. I found it very moving uh, the way they wrote the stories and the the quality of the craftsmanship and the, the history that they were telling and all the rest of it. And then yes, also films were, were dovetailing in there at the same time. So I think I was about eleven or twelve when I first saw Sink the Bismarck on uh, t TV, for example. I don't think they ever showed Battle of the River Plate very much, but I think the Bismarck was one of those prominent favorites, just like The Longest Day or, uh, you know, some, some Where Eagles Dare, things like that, some World War II stuff in particular. But I even remember a couple times on afternoons they'd have, they'd show something fairly exotic like Waterloo, and I'd be watching it, and I'd be completely fascinated. So I think a combination of those influences finally made me decide that when I went off to uni, I was going to major in history. And my father, I remember telling him that, and he said, um, I don't think you want to do history. Because <laughs> why, why don't you be a lawyer? Why don't you go into law? You're an argumentative little son of a, you know. <laughs> You'll make more money being a lawyer. <laughs> and I said, no, I, I think uh, if, if I don't go into journalism, I, I think I'd, I'd, like to do, uh, I'd like to do history. And I didn't want to go into journalism because I'd, I'd worked in a high school newspaper as the editor in my senior year. And it was such a headache that the idea of writing uh, every week under those kinds of deadlines and that kind of pressure, I had this uh, same thing, media image of journalists uh, not living beyond the age of 35, probably dying of alcoholism and uh, chain smoking. And I thought, all right, <laughs> that, that looks a bit intense. Uh, <laughs> so I, I went into history and I went uh, into military. I had... I, I had I had a similar kind of experience with the, the journalist idea. Until I was about 21, I had this idea, 2021, 20, I was going to be a journalist. Yeah. Um, and I was completely... Un I can't think really of a profession I was least suited to than being a journalist because I don't really like talking to people very much. So that's not really good for a journalist. Um, but the thing that put me off was I had this kind of rose... Uh, rosy vision of what a journalist was. And I wanted to be a sports journalist, naturally, of course. Um and then uh, I met a journalist and it ticked every single stereotypical box you, you could think of. Um, he was kind of in your face a little bit. He smoked endlessly. He, he drank a lot. Um, the first thing he said, he was, oh, let's go down the pub. And he was, he was sinking <laughs> pints all the time. And uh, I thought, I can't do this. I can't keep up with this. This isn't me at all. So I think there's quite a, a sudden change and and decided at the end of the towards the end of the degree what the hell am I going to do now and so then it kind of be, became history 
um, as doing something more purposive with it, I suppose. Um, but the, the, one of the influences as well that people you're at, at school, and at primary school for a couple of years, our new headmaster um, was a Polish fighter pilot uh, from the wow. Second World War. Um, and he used to regale us with tales of his time in a typhoon um, in 1942 and so on. Um, and, of course, all the boys were listening to every possible thing he could possibly say about this, and it was all fascinating. And that becomes kind of inspirational um, in terms of making you think about, you know, the, the, the history of the war. Because for, for me, it was only, what, 30 years after the Second World War that um, I was at primary school, and so, so it wasn't that long afterwards. Um and so there were lots of different experiences. We had a war museum at school that I was part of. Or we, we got knickknacks from the um, family at home and put them on these shelves and things. And one of the teachers had a really, uh, she'd had a really bad war experience and didn't like, hate, hated every minute of it. And so she was constantly trying to cover it up so that no one could see it. So there's this battle between <laughs> the war, the war kids, and the uh, the right on teacher saying, no, 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 we you know we should be rejecting all of this. Um, so your experiences at, school, at primary schools were really important, I would have thought, um, you know, in, in shaping what you do. Um, but I mean, the other thing, I suppose, is films uh, that you, you, you've mentioned. Um, and I think that's something that you, you, we talk about and use a, a, a lot in, in terms of teaching. And I, I don't know you guys, it's because it shaped the way in which we teach. I always make references to films. When I'm teaching, I'll say, you know, just like in the film, I don't know the guns of Navarro when you're explaining the um, the Aegean campaign in you know, the autumn of 1943. Now, up until about ten years ago, they would nod. Kind of That's right. Um, they would nod and they would understand, even if they were born decades after the film had been made. They'd all know the film and vaguely know the mm. reference because they're mm. all studying military history or war studies or whatever. Now, doesn't work anymore. And I, I, my cultural references have less and less impact on students anyway because of the increasing age gap. So any kind of reference to music or anything like that. It's film now. It's complete. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it's it's nearly a quarter of a century old. Um, But I think there's there's something different um, as well. It's not just because these films are old. I had seen The Battle of the River Plate and it was made, I don't know, 15 years before I was born, something like that. So 59, I think. Yeah, yeah, okay, 20, nearly... uh, No... Some years before I was born. Anyway, I can't do the maths on that. Um, so, but we were aware of them. But now, the kind of influences that shaped us into be- thinking about history of war and so on, I, I don't think it has the same kind of impact that um, in terms of feature films as, as, as it did it, then. It could be, it could be simply know. generational, John. I mean, uh, the fact is, is that you and I, at least, were, were born in the late 60s and uh, our, my my grandfather was in the World War II generation. My father was born in the late 1930s. So that the war, as uh, Spence was saying, is death. there's a film about the war. There was only one war in question. It was a world war. It was totally huge. It was totally awesome. It had everything in it. Uh, there were millions of people died. Uh, it was the Holocaust, everything else, atomic bombs, for, for crying out loud. I mean, uh, you could watch a movie like The Longest Day and watch these guys all storm beaches and there's tanks and aircraft flying around. You're going, what the hell? It was this huge thing that happened to our older generation. So you might suggest that there's a natural curiosity, a kind of pull to say, what did our what did our forefathers, you know, literally our forefathers, uh, uh, go through? What was their experience? And it you could say that a lot of World War II films and, and perhaps even First World War films as well that, that came out during the war in the 1950s, 60s, even 70s were telling and retelling that story. And, of course, it was affecting not just the people who lived through it, but also their children and, in, in my case, for example, their grandchildren. I was kind of pulled towards the idea of this was something that uh, they had gone through and it was, uh, it was totally life-changing. For them, who knows what it'll be like uh, for our kids? Uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now, when they're talking about, you know, how World War Three started with uh, Ukraine, you know, <laughs> who, who knows? But, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think the experiences that shape what we, how we perceive our past and so on, change, and um, the references that we make in, in terms of 
to when we were growing up are, are obviously different and you would want them to be. So um, what appears to us as being part of living memory, of course, is to a, a lot of people, students particularly, um, is ancient history. The fact that the Berlin Wall coming down and so on. I mean, it's over 30 years ago. <laughs> yes. and, you know, that, that put, puts things in perspective a little bit. But I, I just think as well, I mean, I entirely agree that that's part of it, but there's also the, the aspect, do do people consume that, that canon of war film history uh, about all things to do with war in the same way that we did? I, I'm not sure. I think people learn in different ways or get their cultural references in different ways now. I, I think a big change, uh, and I agree with you, John, that 10 years ago when I started really, you could make references to quite obscure old war films and the students would not, they'd have this cultural awareness of it. And that, that was fading over the last decade. What it's been replaced with in my experience is um, a cultural reference point to video games. And if I make references to um, Call of Duties, for example, and, and you know, I, hand on heart, I've played all the Call of Duties, so I know, I know how these campaigns work. They know these things, and there are touchpoint references that they can still refer to. And that's really interesting to me, partially because the portrayal of war in the Call of Duty games is, in, is, is in my mind, is, it's even less subtle than some of the more jingoistic war films you got just after the Second World War. It's, it's fascinating, and, and I've got a completely unprovable theory that the Call of Duties became more simplistic during the, the late noughties and into the, the teenies of the 21st century in response to complexities in America's ongoing wars. As the war on terror became murkier and darker and more difficult, so game developers tended to look towards what seemed to be a much clearer good versus evil war, the Second World War especially. Although they also, Call of Duty has roamed around the time frame a little bit and, and featured this. And one thing that, that's always fascinated me, and, and I've looked all over the place for this for, for points of discussion is the fact that um, some of the Call of Duty war games quite openly encourage you to commit war crimes. So for example, an early Call of Duty, or an early-ish Call of Duty war game, Call of Duty World of War, there's a scene where you're supposed to be playing a Russian soldier during the storming of Berlin or possibly the, the Silo Heights. And there's a scene where you're confronted with a group of surrendered Germans and you're given an option not to accept their surrender, but how you kill them. You can machine gun them or you can burn them with a Molotov cocktail. And you, as an, and of course, it's a bit different. You're you're participating in that. You you are being asked by the game, how do you kill these people? And they're Nazis, so that's all they deserve. And it's I think there's actually a really interesting conversation to be had about the interaction of the messages of video games, which are of course it's a mass media entertainment. There's an argument that because you you are guiding the game, you're more emotionally involved in it than watching a film, for example. But it's about, it creates this image. And one thing it really creates, and I suppose there's always been this feature of war studies nerdery, what we call rivet counters or track heads. For war games and, and computer games especially, and, and I'm particularly thinking of World of Tanks, which is a huge influence on a certain subsect of our students, is an obsession with what would happen if a Cromwell with side armour encountered a Challenger 2 in the middle of a desert, in a sandstorm. You know, these incredibly minute duels. Yeah. And the same with World of Warships. You know, World what happens if yeah. HMS Renown encounters you know, the Mushashi uh, in 1942 in a typhoon? And they know all sorts of things about, well, the, you know, the penetration on these turrets was high. And, uh, but what's interesting is, of course, the human element of war gets sort of lost in that. And, and that's, again, I, I think, an element where in... Um, War films, you really have that kind of tech element. Somebody might go, but the replay, for example, well, the grasp is much more powerful than individually Ajax, Achilles, or Exeter, but they don't then go, well, the turret penetration of grass speed is actually higher than this. And yet, video games encourage you to think it in that way. One of the fascinating things about video games is they remove the friction of war. Um, or uh, Some include it, but most don't include this. And yet that, for me, is the cultural touch point that most of our students, particularly our male students, come from with war. They, they've played the computer games, they've been excited by the visuals, they've often been excited by the technical or the, the kit aspects, uh, and that's their starting point. Um, and I'm sure you've seen it, chaps, 
that particularly first year essays, there's a certain type of student who wants to tell you all about the kit. And, and mm. some of those students never lose that habit. <laughs> I've got a student well, at the moment who wants to do his dissertation on small, modified small arms of the Second World War um, and clearly knows this uh, to an unbelievable level. So that kind of kit bashing, I, I think, comes from video games now. Well, well you, you, uh, that's partly true. I think there's, there's something in that, but I, I remember... I've, I, I don't I don't do video games. It's one vice I've never got into whatsoever, other than Space Invaders back in the day. That's just about as close as I ever got to it. Um, but we did play tabletop games with figures and tanks and all that kind of thing. And the rules for those kind of games were driven in the same kind of way as what you're saying. There's some rule sets for World War Two games where you'd have... It's like logarithmic tables to work out armor penetration value of this shell, this re this range, and so on. So there is that kind of um, measurement, mechanical, um, statistical driven, uh, kit based driven attitude um, to, to the way in which war is perceived. And I think we get that from those kind of gaming things, because I, I mean, in terms of pet theories, I also have a pet theory that um, one of the reasons. Um, military history is often written in the way that it is, that it's predominantly still, uh, sadly written, it's by blokes, um, uh, usually white blokes, and blokes tend to be interested more, I, I think, in technical measurements, statistics, data, in terms of, for example, is the, the famous thing, which, you know, is particularly dodgy, how do you sell a car? Well, if you're selling a car to a man, you emphasise horsepower, brake speed, overhead cam, all the technical stuff, and so on. If you're selling it um, to to a woman, uh, you talk about reliability, um, the the fact of you know, safety, and all the features. And marketing companies shape their marketing in order to target the market. Now, why that's relevant? I think it's relevant because it tends to be that military history is written by men who then interpret things in that kind of way. Some of it could be from those kind of computer games, perhaps, but also from the games in the past in that um, you can capture and you can measure things. I don't know if there's something Freudian in this, but you can measure the kind of elements of uh, what things can do at certain times on, on the battlefield. Of course, it, it misses out the other elements of it. I mean, how, <laughs> all, all those games that I remember playing as, as a kid, which again has shaped where it came from, making the model kits and so on. You play games, tabletop war games, World War Two. it's dominated by tanks. The infantry are just there to get mown down and squashed, where in fact they're, they're the most important element on the battlefield. Um, but it is about, you know, that this tank has got this huge super gun. There'll be an arms race with friends trying to get the right kind of tank with the 17-pounder to deal with Dave's Tiger Two, and you need that because he's built a Tiger II. Um, mm. And I think we do get draw a lot from that um, in terms of where we start as kids. It's how it then transfers into interpreting, understanding war later in life, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I think there's an interesting point there as well, John. I think that the, the the idea of war as a form of entertainment, and that I don't know, I don't have these statistics. This is just a, a supposition, but just a, if you look at how modern video games are marketed, the military themed video games are marketed, even um, modern uh, board games uh, with a military theme or miniatures games with a military theme, they are overwhelmingly marketed at males. And the, the, the link, I think, between war as a form of entertainment, it's certainly in Britain, you, you see the soldier as an iconic figure and, and war as, as a form of something to be um, read about and enjoyed in almost a vicarious manner uh, in the from the 1880s onwards, and I, I don't really think we've we've changed much in Britain from from about 140 years ago. War is still something to be consumed in, a, and I don't necessarily think this is terribly healthy all, all the time, but as, as a form of entertainment, and it, it affects a certain sort of type of person, but they are overwhelmingly male. You only have to go on on Twitter. Uh, during the current Russia-Ukraine conflict, and the number of people who I have to say are overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly of middle age, some of whom do have genuine backgrounds in this, your former soldiers or the defence analysts, but many of whom are, are people with very, very tenuous links to the Russia-Ukraine conflict, especially in terms of expertise, everybody wants to share their opinion. And many of these opinions are decidedly half-baked. And it is interesting that 
to me, this this is this is a theme that stretches right back to the late Victorian period. And there's a great cartoon from from 1914 that captures this idea of war as entertainment, and then therefore all males are entitled to have an opinion on it. And it's from the outbreak of war. Oh, sorry, early in the war in 1914, and it was a cartoon. I think it was from Punch or one of those satirical magazines, Bystander. And it's a, a group of buffers with big Victorian moustaches, and they're all queuing up in the writing room of the British Library, uh, and they're all going to give their opinion to the letters page because they know how the war should be fought. Yeah. And it's exactly the same now, except on social media. But the only reason I think that happens is that we, in the West, often view war as something to be, you know, it's quite thrilling, it's quite enjoyable, because we're distant from it as well. I imagine if, you know, the West was gripped in the kind of war Russian Ukraine was in, people wouldn't be so entertained by it, to say the very least. But when it's at a distance, everybody's got an opinion. And um, that's, I, I think, ties into this whole culture of war movies, war video games, war board games, war as entertainment. And I think that's actually an idea that's really worth exploring in a, in a wider academic sense, because I think a lot of the work that's been done on it is often um, comes it from such an avowedly anti-war stance. But um, nevertheless, it's been an enduring sort of cultural thing where it's been around for over 100 years. It's endured the First World War and the Second World War, the Vietnam War, the War on Terror, all these either horrific wars in terms of human cost or murky wars in terms of moral equivalence. And yet people still do it. And it's, it's interesting it, to me. It, it may go back much further than that because uh, even the Victorians and the Edwardians were constantly referring to wars in classical terms. So they were referring all the time to uh, the Iliad or uh, great you know, Greek heroes and myths and conflicts going on. Could be the Peloponnesian War, the Romans. They were obsessed. It's reflected in the architecture, uh, Victorian revivals and all the rest of it, neoclassicism. But, I mean, myths... Legends, gods, heroes, battles, and throw in a few monsters and some damsels in distress, and you've got a classic formula that in many respects, yeah, has been played out over and over again. And as John suggests, it's it's often predominantly male. Uh, there's very few, you know, most of the heroes in, uh, in the, the, the Trojan War are, are male. Uh, uh, the women like Cassiopeia tend to say, stop, stop, don't bring that Trojan horse into the city. And she's immediately ignored, you know. Perhaps if she had been a, a, a general instead, someone might have paid attention to her and uh, the city might have survived, what have you. But I mean, um, there is an obsession with uh, weapons. And uh, I, I also say it's, it's not just about the tech, it's also about tactics. People are obsessed with battles. Uh, so they want to get into a lot of the students, uh, first, first year undergraduate students want to spend a lot of time discussing the sort of what I call the ballet of battle. So the left flank, the right flank, start, you know, minutely chronic, you know, chronicling what happened on June 18, 1815 and the Battle of Waterloo, who did what, who launched whose division, how that affected uh, the decision making, the, 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 the gap that opened in the line, shuffling brigade, this kind of drama uh, minutely played out over and over and over again, reflected uh, not just in book after book after book about the same battle over and over again, so that even John Keegan was saying, what can we possibly say new about the Battle of Waterloo in the face of battle? And actually saying, well, there's quite a bit that we could tell that hasn't been discussed yet, particularly, say, from the perspective of a, a conscript rank-and-file soldier, for example, not just about the generalship uh, side of things or the bird's-eye view of things that's reflected, of course, predominantly in video games today or even tabletop games. It's all about the generals controlling things. It's all about tabletop bird's-eye view control of situations that, by definition, in many respects, battles are uncontrollable. They're pure chaos. But Perhaps as men, uh, we like to problem solve. We like to, you know, sort of tinker with things and, you know, assert control over any situation as desperately as we can. And I have a little treat for you. When I was a senior in high school, I had a sort of uh, fourth year uh, honors project. And lo and behold, I did the 15 most decisive battles in history. So I had uh, all these different <laughs> battles. Oh, I did this when I was 16. So I had all these different battles and included maps. And as you can see, Howard was already getting into arrows and breaking a battle of Canada there. There's the Romans. And I had 15 battles. And every, every battle had its own section. So it had things on different soldiers and all the rest of it. And uh, this is what impressed Wick Murray at Ohio State more. He was like, you are a nerd. You're going to be one of us. 
but every section also had a thing on weapons and tactics. So I had, uh, you know, ancient battles, I had the Spanish Armada, but everything had a special boxed out section on weapons and tactics. Sometimes it would have a biography on military leaders. It was very formulaic because, of course, that's what I was reading. I was watching war films, and yes, by the time I was a teenager in the 1980s, there were plenty of war games that could be played, both on home console systems and also on very primitive uh, you know, PCs. You know, if, you had a, if you had a Commodore 64, uh, you were definitely playing some kind of war game. If you were into this kind of thing, you were playing with very primitive box-level strategy games or something like that on a hexagonal grid. Uh, and that's what I produced, and that's what sort of guided me towards a, a career in military history. But the thing is, even though I had Wick Murray as a supervisor at Ohio State, and he was categorically a military historian, and he was also a World War II expert uh, predominantly, he was basically telling me, he says, all right, that's your ticket into the profession, perhaps. You can, I have no doubt you can tell me a lot about armor penetration values of the Bismarck versus the Hood and all the rest of it. He says, you've proven yourself to be that kind of uh, anorak, you're into this subject. Of, but we're not necessarily going to be teaching you that at the university level. We're going to be teaching you about wars and continuation of politics by other means. We're going to be talking about things like the stuff about war that can't be controlled, the things like uh, decision-making, uh, fog of war, friction of war, when plans go awry, or when you can't even see the battlefield, what happens? You know, the chaos of things, because it's like, as you grow older... Uh, you'll begin to realize that maybe we're not necessarily in control of life. Uh, sometimes life seems more in control of us. And, uh, and this is part of the learning process. And let's see if that can be reflected in your scholarship. And uh, it's true enough, I, I find that you know, a lot of our war studies undergraduate students, we have to kind of wean them off of the video games and the emphasis on weapons and tactics and battles. And it's like, well, okay, these are important. We all know we can get into these kinds of discussions, but what's going to delineate your analysis of why it's significant and what it really means and what we can learn from it, perhaps, as opposed to the half-baked people who are lining up to tell us about how to win the war on the Western Front in 1914 are telling us about what's going to happen in the Ukraine right now. So there is that sort of learning curve that's involved in this profession, perhaps, <laughs> We are perhaps the nerds of the nerds who've made it this far, but um, we have to constantly remind our colleagues, perhaps, at the university and, and wider school that our department is such, and people in the department teaching uh, this degree and at the MA, you know, graduate level, undergraduate level, PhDs, we're not completely focused on the kit uh, anymore. You know, we're still fascinated by it, but... <clears throat> Yeah, I think there's an element to that. When I, when I first started, um, our, our current head of history uh, classified that one day I'd be the chair of Airfix history um, in, in the in the department, which is which is as you know, kind of how you are perceived elsewhere. But I think there are there are moments when you start to see the subject slightly different. I remember which you kind of think about cultural things, which make us shift our understanding of the subject a little bit, make us think about it differently. I remember seeing when I was about 12 or 13, a TV dramatisation called Churchill and the Generals. We had Timothy West as uh, Winston Churchill, um, Arthur Hill, who was in various things, who's played Roosevelt and, and so on. Joseph Cotton was Marshall. Uh, it's really good. and um, But what it was, it was pitched not at frontline fighting level it was pitched at who on earth the chief of the imperial general staff was um what were the what was the casablanca conference about what were all of these meetings between churchill and roosevelt and brooke and so on in terms of controlling and running the war now clearly it's, a, it's an amalgam of various things and they've cut corners and so on in order to make a a, a dramatized account of it um but it was quite interesting because it suddenly showed there's a bit more going on rather than here's a Sherman tank or, you know, what's happening at battle level. It was trying to put it at a big strategic level. And that kind of sparked my interest a little bit more. Um, so I, I was already interested in that before I got to uh, got to university and we started talking, uh, again, inspirational teachers. The person who taught me there was a guy called John Gooch, and he did loads of stuff on strategic history. But he, his interest was pitched at that allied 
um, grand strategy kind of level at um, uh, in one of the courses he taught, which is specifically about conferences and um, cooperation between the allies and running the war and so on at a big grand strategic level. Um, and that makes you kind of interested that there are different layers to what we look at. And it's it's fine having that interest in the the tactical kit based stuff. It certainly plays a role. It can be interesting and the development and, and so on. Uh, but seeing it as part of a bigger picture is quite important in understanding the subject. And some of those references earlier on um, perhaps lead you in a different direction as, as to what we're interested in rather than, you know, I've just built the latest airfix kit or I'm playing this computer game which I can shoot Germans or something like that. And you, you know, um, but hmm. So when did, when did you start playing computer games then? Well, me? Yeah. Oh, both, both of uh, you. I don't play them, so I don't know. I've n I never had a Commodore 64. My first serious interaction with a computer was when I uh, traded in some music kit in the late 80s in order to get a word processor to write my PhD thesis. Nice. So my first my first computer was an Atari, um, which uh, had like a, it had a desktop publishing package in Atari ST. And Atari ST, the 16-bit yeah. model. Yeah. So not, I, for, not I, for games, though. I started playing arcade games um, with my dad. So we'd be on holiday, and this is the 80s, uh, the late 80s. You know, every sort of British holiday resort had an arcade. And I, they just blew me away, the, the graphics, the sound, the, the, the excitement of them. And my first computer, um, God bless my parents, I don't know how they ended up with this. They, they probably got me one of the most obscure <laughs> British available computers in the, the country, which was an Atari 8-bit computer system not the console system it was an atari 65 xe it was really difficult to get the games for it because it was an obscure very obscure within britain and i absolutely loved it and i've been a comp avid computer game ever since interesting thing actually though about starting to get a different perception of, of war through computer games there's a game, and it wasn't exclusive to the Atari. It, it was available on a, I believe it's available on other systems. That was called Eastern Front, which was primarily about the Eastern Front 1941-42, and you could only play it from a German perspective. And it was a little bit abstracted in that you, you, it wasn't sort of modelled on the, 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 the completely the real forces, but you, you had German infantry divisions, German panzer divisions, you had Hungarians, Romanians, um, Finns, and so on available to you. And the idea was you had to try and recreate opera, Operation Barbarossa. The, the, it's considered a classic, actually. If anyone's listening to this and is interested in classic um, computer strategy games, Eastern Front is considered one of the all-time classics. You can play it for free online now. And I had it. And it was actually a really interesting educational game because the game box, so I'd been, ooh, I don't know, eight or nine, and the game box came with loads of information in it. It came with a map of the, the historic Eastern Front, a book of, of sort of um, really good popular history about how the Eastern Front really was. And the premise of the game was absolutely intriguing because as the Germans, you couldn't win. You, you could only play as the Germans and you couldn't win. It, the game made clear that the, it was basically impossible to, to succeed in the conquest of Russia. And it was more about managing the chaos of the invasion and the difficulties you faced. Now, there were lots of different options you could try, you know, thrust from Moscow or go south or, or you know, a whole host of things. But in the end, you, you were just run into trouble. And it had the season, so you'd have the Rasputin Kitsa, then you know the winter, the Soviet counterattack over the winter and things. And it, it really taught me a, a, a lot about... The difficult, some of the difficulties. Now, I mean, it, yes, it was a simple game, but it, it posed you questions and made you think, okay, we've got this almost unwinnable situation. How do we make the best of it? And it included things like trying to rotate your units out, and you never could. One of the things that I remember was you'd start off in, in with Barbarossa and you'd use your panzers to really smash through, and you'd go, this is fantastic. But they get worn out. They, they, they'd need time out of the front, and you'd have to, your foot sluggers would take ages to catch up. Then you'd just about get your panzers back up and running again, and then they'd run into the mud, and then the winter would come, and you'd try and get this reserve to counterattack, and, and you couldn't do it, and the, the, the Russians would just overwhelm you. I remember the ones getting pushed all the way back to the Polish border by about January 1942. But it was really interesting, and that's actually the first war game that I, I can remember playing, and uh, it's considered a total classic now. So if you're interested in classic computer war games, 
a take a look. But so I, I've been playing war games from or computer games from an extremely early age, and uh, I'm afraid they're they're probably my greatest vice. Um, <laughs> many many hours of good writing time has been lost playing a host of games, and I still That's, think they're don't fantastic. Don't say that. We we can't say that live on the air. All right, you're not supposed to admit that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, I, what about well, you, Howard? Well, I mean, I, I was hitting the arcades, so. like you say, as soon as there were arcades. I mean, uh, video arcades, at, at least. I would have been about yeah, 11, 12, something like that. So when Space Invaders was out, then particularly Asteroids, and then you had all these video games were taking over. I spent a lot of time in the arcade, uh, fine. But as you say, arcade games were about reaction. Uh, so it was about, you know, clicking really fast, quick reflexes, uh, putting in quarter after quarter to do a series of basic moves that you would master. And for me, the, the sort of warrior game that I eventually controlled was, was Robotron, which was simply two joysticks, a dude in the center surrounded by an army of robots. And it was a notoriously difficult game to play in the arcade in the 1980s. And uh, I flipped it over. It flipped over at like 10 million, and on one quarter, I think I, it took me about three hours, and I never died. Uh, I actually was one of the few legends in the in the local area who could say he flipped over a Robotron game. <laughs> and I got to the point where... Like, legend in the local yeah, area. Yeah, I, I was okay. literally playing play the game in a sort of zen-like... You reach this zen-like state where you're just kind of like not even looking at the screen and doing these fantastic moves, and you're doing it all through peripheral vision, and you're totally zen into it. But... Uh, but no, I mean, the, the real fascination for me as well was at the same time, computer games at least, were offering you an alternative to play outside of an arcade, play at home where you had more time and you weren't, you know, you, your time wasn't dependent on the, the, how long the string of quarters was you had in your pocket. So PC games like... Um, in particular, uh, like Commodore 64 games, they started introducing strategy games. Now, strategy games you could play for a long time and you had more time to delve into not just quick reactions and specific battles, but running an entire campaign, like you say. And funny enough, um, a friend of mine, uh, George Chapman, I was growing up with, he was an Air Force brat as well. He got into IT and computers, and he was doing, like, doing computer basic programming. He's very wealthy now, and he owns his own software company. But him and I got together when we were like 15 or something, and we decided we were going to write our own uh, game. And there was no question it was going to be a war game. So I basically constructed like the game, like the basic parameters of the game, and he kind of programmed it, and he sent this off to a gaming magazine with, you know, these, you could... Uh, copy the programming at home and you could play that game yourself and the game that we did was sink the bismarck so the first game i ever did was sink the bismarck and it was very we had we drew very similar block character graphic this is the bismarck this is prince oigan this is the hood this is rodney and uh we were very young but you know again it was here's a cat and mouse game basically uh in terms of the mechanics of it and uh you know you're trying to do this, and each character has its own characteristics. It was very crude, very basic. But, uh, yeah, by the time I was an undergraduate, uh, unfortunately, I had a computer with me uh, as well. And while I was using it for word processing, turning in essays, uh, increasingly I was also playing strategy games, uh, and it burned off a lot of hours. It's true. And then uh, when I was an undergraduate, I was also board gaming with with fellow students so we were playing risk a lot and we were playing other games and uh and eventually i got more interested in the idea of tweaking rules and and building my own war game systems and and all the rest of it and then i was doing american civil war stuff on, on top so one thing tended to complement the other films games books even study but i'd say that eventually you do you always have your sort of lust for you know, strategy and tactics and weapons and, and all the rest of it. That's exactly what World of Tanks and World of Warships, for example, is feeding off of. It's a, a gladiatorial contest, and they're feeding off people's lust for gladiatorial contests. Uh, throw in a little... I've noticed on World of Warships, for example, that a lot of the ships that are being thrown in now are ships that were never even created. They, somebody did some research, found ships that the Germans were planning to build or that the British were planning to build, uh, and uh, they say, "Well, look, we're, we're going to make that ship real, and now throw that up against the uh, against the Bismarck and just see what happens." And people are like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, let's throw that in." And the same way, in the back of your mind, you imagine the Romans going, "Well, what if we take a lion, and we have five really pissed off elephants <laughs> fighting him?" 
or uh, you know, twenty drunk Christians versus two tigers. What would happen? Place your bets. And okay, it's fine, but just as a lot of people in in the empire got a bit bored after a while with the games, it became increasingly outlandish. I think there is a sort of level you reach, perhaps, where people eventually will get sort of satiated and bored, perhaps, with gladiator contests and and just you know clicking of buttons and all the rest of it. I think you get a lot more gratification and you get a lot more stimulation overall if you're actually managing a civilization or you're fighting an entire war and there's a lot more nuance involved, things like weather, things like uh, political factors and all the rest of it. The, the, something that's a bit more lifelike. Mm. Uh, there's an element that. Do you think there's a point at which when you're playing some of these games that you start to see the deficiencies in them and you want to add layers to something to make it better. I force you two to play War in Europe, the big SPI hex based game, which takes nine months to play, 108 hours playing time. It's a big SPI board game, 46 square feet of map, which I acquired in the early 80s. Um, and I played it two or three times to about 1943. You never get past 1943 because the German player gets bored and or discovers girls or something and disappears and you never see them again. Um, but one of the things that became increasingly frustrating about that game and other games similarly, I, I think, is that the more you read around, you start to see the, the weaknesses in what it's portraying. And you start to, I, I know with a friend, we started to add this layer of um, a political grand strategy on top where or it's like a car driven element to it um, to add to the rather feeble political angle to that game because it had lots about maneuvering and evading countries and running economies and things in a kind of mechanistic way rather clunky but it did it didn't do so well at the 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 political strategic diplomatic level i just wonder whether games the more you play them especially when you know something about the the broader issues in the subject um the more you play the more you more you and learn about the subject you start to see the deficiencies and then you want to change and tweak it and i I think that's something you've seen what the went sometimes with the students where they come at the start of the uh, the degree um, with their statistical analysis of this, that and the other. And this is only a small number, I have to say. It's only a small number of the students arrive with this kind of attitude <laughs> to, to uh, how, how, it, how it all works. Um, but nonetheless, and um, they start. you start to add different dimensions and complexity, which make the games perhaps more unsatisfying. I can't play... I don't like playing World War II tactical games... Um, very much because I, I, they're driven by the wrong kind of things. The more you study it, you think well, it's, it's nothing like that. I can play a game about something I don't know much about, but it becomes unsatisfying. I, I don't know. Is that your experience? Well, I mean, do people get dissatisfied with war porn, as it were? Well, probably. You know, I mean, it's there's porn and then there's love, John. You know, I mean, take your satisfaction <laughs> as, as you will. You know. But, I mean, even in terms of, uh, like, risk, when we were playing drunken games of that as undergraduates on a, on a you know, sat- Sunday afternoon or something, we did start tweaking that. One of the first tweaks that I introduced was a whole set of rules uh, that included weather, random natural disasters, but in particular strategic weapons. I said, well, we, let's throw in nuclear weapons with risk. And we, I designed extra cards and did a big map, and we called it Super Risk. And here's the thing. Once you introduce strategic weapons in a game of risk... It was interesting because now players who had strategic weapons could start threatening one another. And that's where the politics could come in on a game like Risk, which made it more interesting. Now, politics uh, is a part of Risk if it's a good Risk game because players will constantly try to form alliances against one another or they will threaten one another. So there are various levels of deterrence and counter deterrence going on in Risk if you're playing a, a really involved, fun game. That guy has got control of Asia, and if we don't band together in three terms, he's going to win. And then, it's, and then the Asia player would say, if you join him in an alliance against me, I will attack you in the next round, and you're done. So take it or leave it. And then these kinds of negotiations would begin. There's actually a diplomatic level. Throwing in strategic weapons only made it more intensified and even worse, especially with you know, the damage that a nuke would do on a certain territory or something like that. But yes, we did start to uh, spice even a, a simplistic Parker Brothers game like that up by adding in more levels of complexity because it made the game more involved and more fun. Uh, 
it was more lifelike. It brought out more strategic or even, you know, as you say, political or even diplomatic nuances involved. And, uh, you know, we took that about as far as we wanted. I think, I think it's interesting in computer games now that, that there's something that, that wasn't around in my childhood or in my adolescence, is that you've got the modding community, people who modify games. And for almost any strategy game sufficiently popular, and even those that are quite obscure, there's a modding community. And just as you're saying, one thing nearly all modding communities of strategy games do is they're driven to make the game more complex. They're driven to add more layers and layers and layers. I think that's that intrigues me. I think the whole idea of game design is, is intriguing because at what point in your quest for realism do you actually turn a game into a job rather than a form of entertainment? You know, we have jobs and 99% of our jobs are probably things that we don't necessarily leap out of bed and think, this is thrilling, I'm enjoying this. Whereas you play a game for the, for the enjoyment. I'd also add a thing, uh, because of course, as, as we as a group, we play board games a lot as well, and strategy games, as well as computer games. The difference between playing with live humans in a game is infinite compared to playing against an AI. Now, AIs nowadays can be very sophisticated, but every single AI I've ever played against in a strategy game eventually becomes predictable because they have a set number of responses. Whereas I know from playing board games and strategy games with you, Pair, and indeed some of our other friends, that given the same stimulus within a game, your reactions will be different. And certainly in your case, Howard, they'll be wildly unpredictable. <laughs> uh, and we never know which version of Howard will appear uh, in a war game, whether it was the time we played Quartermaster General 1914 and you, you as Germany in 1914 decided you needed to dig in on the river on the Rhine <laughs> and just beg Austro-Hungary for help, or you're going to play the Russians and you're just going to be this relentless steamroller that just throws army after army after army into East Prussia. But we don't know which version we're going to get. And so the unpredictability, I think, and the human interaction in, in war games is what's great. And I think that's actually a really interesting difference between the games of the 70s and 80s, which I played, of course, some decades basically after they were published. Those games tend to be quite mechanistic, lots of tables, lots of calculations, whereas now there's a lot more card-driven games where there's a random element, there's a deck element, there's, there's more unpredictability. It's about managing chaos rather than uh, maintaining order in some ways. And I think that's great because it encourages human creativity, unpredictability. Um, you know, we've each got our own play styles. We can sort of predict what we might do in those situations, but you, you just never know. So it's, I think that's, and that speaks to something. It speaks to the friction of war and, and the interactions of, of people, and that's something that computer games cannot reproduce in the same way. Uh, and there's some great computer strategy games that are great fun, that are full of unpredictable things, but when you throw a lot of humans into the mix, the game just goes to another level, in my opinion. I think the same thing is an important point about well. what. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, well, I, I, I was going to say that the, the, one of the, the differences is that. Um, what you allude to is where you make the transition from a game which is purely an entertainment over a few drinks or snacks or pizza or whatever in an evening and one in which you're trying to deliver some kind of outcome you know you're trying to get some points across now most of the people who design these games uh, are trying to get something across um but it's, it's also to a degree a commercial enterprise but when we use it in, in teaching we use these kind of game strategies and things and, uh, and so on in in teachings, there's a point to it, you know, trying to get something across. And where does it become a simulation and where does it stop being becoming a game, you know, moves from being a game to into some, purely in terms of a teaching aid. Um, and it's somewhere between the two. But it picks up a lot of interest of our own interest in terms of where games have been um, a key element in getting us interested in the subject. But also a lot of the students come with those kind of things as well, with mostly computer games now, I freely admit, but not entirely. Um but a lot of them do enjoy it. I mean, I, I just on Monday, um, we did our uh, teaching a module on, on Normandy, and we talked about um, the use of armoured forces and the experience of tank crews and things. But then we got a game out to try and simulate some of the tactical issues and difficulties um, in uh, capturing an element of the problems confronting um, crews in Normandy. And the students played out the, the kind of card-driven game, which is fairly simplistic in, in many ways, but it highlights some of the issues. So there's a point in which you can draw something out of it. And you can take that gaming uh, thinking um, into 
how we learn about a subject. It does highlight particular key elements of it, I think. Um, you know, you know, even when across. I was saying uh, I had an inspirational teacher in high school, my history teacher, one of the things that he did was, uh, I remember now, he had, a, he had a game exercise. So one day we went into class. We never knew what we were going to get. We walked into this guy's class. And one day he made us play a, a, a role-playing game called Guns and Butter. Now, bear in mind, this is at the height of the Cold War. So, and we live next to an Air Force base, so the idea of nuclear war was just something we grew up with. It was just there every day. So there we were playing guns and butter. So we split up into teams, and uh, everybody had a country, and they had various options of what they could do in a various crises or how they would relate to the other teams. And, of course, most of us just wanted to take our nuclear weapons immediately and just throw nukes to solve problems. And, uh, you know, Gordian not the whole situation. Like, well, the key is obvious. You just nuke them at the first opportunity. But as it turned out, to the subtleties of the game, uh, we would be constantly outmaneuvered by other teams who were using their weapons in a more sophisticated way, building coalitions against us, undermining our ability to, to even fight or whatever economically, investing more in the butter side of things as opposed to just raw guns. And it was a nice way of saying, well, in a game of guns and butter, uh, it doesn't necessarily always go to the guns. And uh, it was just a simple exercise done at that thing, and then we moved on the next week to, to other material. But, yeah, I mean, a, a good game, a good film, um, you know, a good book, for that matter, is something that kind of moves beyond just – not just a number crunching, not just a – ballet gladiatorial crunch of opposing statistics and things like that but also yeah the, the more human factor feelings emotions interaction between people the the little things that perhaps affected fate uh that's probably the thing that makes the iliad the most interesting it's not necessarily hector finally fighting achilles it's he it's achilles feelings going into that duel that have been enraged because of the death of Patroclus and the, the maneuverings of the gods and all the rest of it. That's where the drama is. That's the drama of military history. Uh, and I, I think that's the kind of thing that if we could, you know, impart that to our students and, and say, well, look, you know, history is, is more uh, three-dimensional than, than we realize. You're talking about real people who lived their lives, who didn't know what was going on, who didn't have a bird's eye view of the situation, were trying to do the best they could, oftentimes made terrible decisions and were uh, selfish to the point of ghastliness, and other times people were heroes. Uh, that's, that's the most captivating, interesting part of military history or war studies to me. I mean, I, I think I've come a long way from doing the 15 most decisive battles in, in, in history. It's still there. That love is still there. But I'm also, I, I suppose, much more interested in the drama, the human drama of things as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I think there's, there's plenty of um, different threads we can pick up on in, in future uh, podcasts and so on. I'm, I'm particularly intrigued. I, I've, I've always been fascinated. I think it's one for the future. Um, I remember being taught at, at, at Lancaster many years ago by John McKenzie, who'd done some work on popular imperialism, juvenile literature, militarism in the late Victorian period and how that is... I think is a really important defining moment in the growth of what Spencer was talking about before, uh, about attitudes to um, war, conflicts, um, uh, the, the, the male-orientated um, uh, uh, approach to understanding the wider world and so on. And you, you see it growing in particularly juvenile literature and things like comic books, and um, which were still going... Um, uh, until a few a, a few decades ago, things like Victor comic and War Lord and things like that, and Commando books and so on. That kind of which captures because one of the key things that I think will, will also be worth interest uh, exploring is why is it that it's mainly white males who are drawn to this subject, and what in ultimately do we have to do to change that dynamic? Because by drawing a different perspective from what we've talked about, we start to see the subjects in a different kind of way, which is exactly what we should be you know, trying to encourage. It's changed slightly, but the the um, where we get some of the best interactions, I think, is where you get history students and war study students coming at the same subject from slightly different perspectives, and sometimes you get different you know dynamics going on. Um, uh, and so it might be worth exploring why it is that we've ended up with, with that kind of um, 
development of it being a particular kind of cultural group who are drawn to the subject and how we can challenge that. But I fear that's a subject for another day. Um, our hour is nearly up, so uh, I think we need to draw an end to this and uh, we'll look at um, perhaps some other subjects on future occasions. Um, so we can pick a subject for next time, but I'll leave it to, uh, to your discretion to go with something next time, <laughs> as opposed to the, the ramblings we've had today, but however interesting it has been. So, um, should we draw an end to this one, I think? Yep, I think so. Thank you, John. Yep. You've been okay. a wonderful host. I, I try my best, and it's your turn next time, I think, Spence. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, then.